Deuteronomy 18, if you'll turn there. Um, if we can sum it up tonight, I want to deal with the occult aspect of spiritual warfare and deliverance. As you recall, we're dealing with a whole range of deliverance. <coughs> spiritual warfare, and uh, you can't talk about too much of it till occult the occult aspect comes in, but we haven't dealt with uh, the occult specifically in this study. Uh, let's begin reading at verse 9. And when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire. This is fire walking quite common all throughout the world, <clears throat> or any that uses divination, that's all forms of fortune telling, and there are scores of forms of divination, an observer of the times, astrology, a chanter, a magician, a witch, literally a sorcerer or sorceress, a charmer, hypnotist, Consulted with familiar spirits, a medium with a spirit guide that goes into a trance, a wizard, a psychic, Gene Dixon, a good example, necromancer, a spiritualist medium, for example, who calls up the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive out, drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Slip that one in. <clears throat> but you see, if you're dabbling in the occult, innocently or otherwise, you can't be perfect. And God says that this is an abomination unto him, and if we took time to look up all the scriptures on the condemnation of it in scripture, uh, in the Bible you would see that uh, God <coughs> shows that it makes a person spiritually unclean, and it's tantamount to worshiping other gods, because all help, healing, power, revelation either comes from, comes from a supernatural source, either comes from God or it comes from uh, the power of Satan, the powers of darkness. And so a visit to a fortune teller is tantamount to worshiping Satan. Now God looks at it that way. That's why it's such an abomination. And it's why that many, many times we deal with people who are third and fourth generation oppressed children. Sometimes they've had no direct contact themselves, but it's they have grandmother who was a card reader, <clears throat> or a mother, or grandfather, sometimes even cousins and uncles. But it does stay in the family, the oppression. The door stays open. And it doesn't mean that a person is automatically oppressed, but off, if they haven't have been involved, that's often they are. Now, a large percentage of the people I deal with, <clears throat> and I guess I deal with about as many as anybody who's in ministry in this day, a large percentage, you have to deal with the occult before you can help them in counseling with them. And I read somewhere where there was a survey among ministers in a European country, and uh, they noted, uh, it, was, it happened to be uh, the questions were directed that way, and they noted that two-thirds of the people they dealt with had to be dealt with from an occult standpoint or they couldn't help them solve the problem. Of course, they were aware, you see, that... Uh, that this was forbidden in Scripture and had to be dealt with. <clears throat> and uh, just for an instance, in my own experience, <clears throat> I became aware of this uh, several years ago. This was before I wrote the book, Angels of Light, and uh, was just beginning to have my eyes opened by the Lord in some of these areas. Just beginning, I mean it was, was in that early period. And I had spoken uh, in a city, and they asked me to stay over, and would I speak, uh, stay for dinner and then speak the next afternoon, which was a Sunday. And uh, uh, for some reason I did. I don't remember why then. Uh, I don't usually do that, you know, stay over just speaking in the afternoon. But <clears throat> I did, 
And I didn't know what to speak on. And the conversation before we had the evening meeting, it was late afternoon, was uh, got around to the occult. And so everyone seemed to be interested, and the Lord uh, just gave me the message. I, I was prepared in other areas. I wasn't prepared in this area, but he gave me the message. So I got up by faith. I was prepared to speak on faith, so I got up by faith <laughs> and taught them. It wasn't a big group. It was in a home, in a home, uh, and uh, maybe a dozen people. And so at the close, this was my first experience of, of dealing with people in a group. I dealt with them individually and taken them through occult delivery. And so after I got through teaching, I said, Now, how many of you have been involved in any way? And every hand went up. See, 12 out of 12. And it's been no different since then. <clears throat> but everywhere I go, it's 10 out of 10. 12 out of 12. 2 out of 2. 1,000 out of 1,000. Sometimes it's been 1,000 or more we've dealt with at one time. And uh, you speak to 1,000, 1,200 people, and they all stay for deliverance. And this happens over and over again. Three, four, five, six hundred, seven, eight hundred people again and again. No one ever leaves. Oh, you might see one or two go because they don't want deliverance. Uh, but it's not because they haven't had some involvement. Because they've never found anybody yet that hasn't. Now, what I mean by that, it's either direct involvement or passive or innocent involvement. Uh, it's in the family history. We're talking about, when we teach on our court, we don't say, now, every one of you have played with a Ouija board or you've visited with fortune teller or a spiritualist meeting or a seance or been uh, under, put under hypnosis or something. But we show how that a person can be oppressed if it's in the family, any participation. And anyone who participates, whether... It is uh, innocent or otherwise, uh, subjects themselves to the, the influences of the powers of darkness, and uh, invariably, sooner or later, symptoms of oppression or subjection will occur. Oppression is uh, like migraine headaches can be the result of a visit to a fortune teller. Uh, subjection would be that you suddenly, when the phone rings, know who's on it before you answer it, or you know the sex of your daughter's baby before it's born. You just know those things. You don't know how you know. You've become psychic, so you're, so you're occultly subjective. And so, <clears throat> I'm not here to prove to this church the uh, damaging effect of dealing with the occult, but uh, I recognize that some of you are not particularly a part of the body here, and you come in to get the teaching or you come in to see what it's all about and you may not know some of the things you'll hear tonight. So we're not going to try to prove these points that we're making as far as arguing people into the faith. You can't. We're just going to state them. And if you have any questions, there's a good book that we'd recommend. <laughs> it's called Angels of Light. It goes out to the well, I, I, I say tens of thousands of copies, but of course it's well over a hundred, a hundred thousand of that one book that's already been printed, I'm sure. And some of the other literature is in the hundreds of thousands, but uh, this is God gave us the revelation and the message. The very few people, as we've been stressing time and again through these studies, really make the connections between our cult oppression uh, our oppression and occult involvement because you see most people have problems physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, domestically uh, you know faced with bankruptcy, divorce uh, migraine headaches can't sleep, nightmares you name any illness you see physically for example and so many times these things are directly related to participation, innocently or otherwise in forms of the occult. But God would have to show you these things, and that's what he began to do several years ago, sending us people who couldn't get help by any other means, began to show us the connections. And he sent, the, sent us some pretty hard cases so that, <clears throat> uh, you know, people who had been uh, many, many places to get deliverance and to get healed and to get helped and to get rid of their psychic problems, some who were on the verge of suicide, mental illness, and that sort of thing, they began to show us the, the direct connection between a visit to a fortune teller and migraine headache, for example. 
our chronic fear and obsession, phobia, and playing with the Ouija board. Our hearing spooky noises and voices at night, chains rattling, windows slamming up and down. When you go check them, they're tightly locked. Uh, things appearing and disappearing in the house. Send us weird people like this. Uh, he would. And we would, we would right away begin to delve into where they'd made an occult contact with an occult spirit. These are spirits working behind fortune tellers, Ouija boards, hypnosis and all that. Hypnotists. And, uh, so now those are things we're not going to try to prove to you if you're new here. That's all laid out in our book, the scripture for it as well as our own experience. But, <clears throat> Who would see the connection between seeing those, uh, having those frightening experiences and a visit to a seance, or seeing apparitions of a dead grandmother, grandfather, just at the point of their death or the death of a mother and father, uh, connect that with uh, having a wart removed by magic charming, or some physical condition that just won't heal with... Uh, uh, a visit to a meeting out of curiosity, say, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness, see what goes on. And things of this nature, like a woman in Florida who wrote from England, we met her in Florida at a meeting, who wrote poetry about um, ghosts and werewolves and all of that. She liked to go around the old castles in England, you know, and then she'd write poetry. She won, she won a uh, prize and had... Uh, had, um, had been recognized by the authorities there, you know, the literature, society of literature, poetic literature. And I said, well, there's a direct... And she couldn't get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, been trying for years. I said, there's a direct connection between you involved in this occult business of just writing about it, you see. She had a morbid interest in it. In fact, you can't get the baptism. Well, she didn't know it was sin, and she, she wanted suggested of herself that she would do it. She said, I'm going home and throw away, when I get back to England, throw away all of these awards I've been given, and I'm going to give up this writing. And uh, we took her through the occult, my wife and I, up in the most hotel room, and immediately she received the baptism. And I mean, the power of God hit her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet, just like a bolt of lightning hit her. She really get, got the evidence that she not only could speak in tongues, but that she had been baptized in the Spirit. <clears throat> Now, where would she ever go throughout the world, throughout this land or throughout the world, where anyone could point out that just writing poetry about ghosts and all of that would open you to oppression? A binding, you see, in this case, a binding of spirits where she couldn't release faith for the baptism. Now, the best people in the world had prayed for her, and we were rather new in the experience of the baptism, so we didn't have any, you know, of that uh, whatever it is that you gain through a lot of experience. We just had the key <clears throat> that it was through this participation. So as I say, most people are not able to discern and recognize the presence and activity of these dark forces. But the trouble with many people, and a lot of the trouble with almost everybody, results from this. And until we have looked into this area, we're not really going to be able to help people much. Uh, if you'll turn over to Galatians chapter 5, for example, I want to show you God's attitude toward participation in any form of these things in Deuteronomy 18 that he calls an abomination. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, he tells us to walk in the Spirit, verse 18, if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now look at the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, witchcraft, occult. See, that's all forms of it. Hatred, variance, and so on. Envies, murders, drugs, revelings. And such like I told you before, and I tell you, as I told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's God's opinion of the occult without reading all the proof texts from Exodus to Revelation, but since Revelation is the last book of the Bible, let's look at the last chapter, the last book, 
and you'll find of all the things God could have talked about to call an abomination and condemn, note carefully one of the things that he had mentioned as being an abomination to him. Revelation 22, uh, verse 13, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, sorcerers. There you are. There's your witchcraft again. Sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth the maker the lie. So <clears throat> there you have two New Testament statements that those who dabble and fool around with the occult are outside the kingdom and have no place in the new, new Jerusalem. Now, the many, many forms of the occult, we could spend a lot of time dis to discussing them and teaching about them, but uh, off and on we do that. I want tonight just kind of give a general picture of some of these things mentioned in Deuteronomy 18. If you'll turn back there, we'll look at some of these terms. And some of the most important, <clears throat> we, will, we will note, show you what they are, and what's wrong with them? And the first thing that he mentions is passing through the fire. We're going to skip that because in this particular culture and area in which we live, you probably wouldn't run into that unless you do a lot of traveling. But it is a worldwide uh, practice, and it's demonic, where um, the uh, devotees of, of all sorts of cult worship uh, to prove that uh, they're under the, protected by their God and under the power and influence of their God, they can literally walk through fire. Heat, for example, heating stones until you can't even get near them, they're so hot. And then they'll walk across that and show absolutely no burn or damage. Uh, but these other things we'll see a lot of. Divination. That's a general term, of course, for all forms of fortune-telling, and there's many forms of fortune-telling, I guess almost, as there are words in the dictionary. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but you can tell a fortune, you can divine with anything. And uh, for those who study and research in this field, as I have, you soon become aware that there, there's just no limit to how you can divine. Now, uh, divination or fortune-telling, which God condemns, is an attempt to see into the spiritual realm to gain knowledge or help uh, predict the future and to know the future. And, of course, God tells us that if we lack wisdom, we're not to ask the Ouija board or the fortune-teller, but to ask him, James 1. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And Deuteronomy 29, 29 plainly states that the hidden things belong to God. That they, th those things which are revealed, he says, belong to us. So there's a difference between revelation, which comes unsought, and it can come by vision or any of the many, many ways that God can reveal himself or his truth or his will or his word, and uh, seeking knowledge or revelation. That's an abomination because, you see, if it was just God you sought such revelation through, it would be, uh, be another matter, but... But there's a, there's a kingdom of darkness out there that's just waiting to accommodate people who, for one reason or another, ignorance, generally not ignorance, just an unwillingness, an impatience to seek truth and wisdom God's way, want to rush in and find out what the future holds or what the answer is going to be or whether they're going to go bankrupt or whether this man will really marry them and... Uh, Whatever it is, they ask fortune tellers, you know, uh, or seek information from the Ouija board, or make contact with the dead, and so on. And so, as I say, there are many forms, uh, uh, ways uh, of telling this from looking at the entrails of chickens, as they do in some cultures, the way the entrails, uh, when they kill a chicken and lay them out, the way they spread out, they can tell your fortune on them. I mean, do it as accurately as a gypsy with her fortune-telling card. Or tell the way that smoke uh, dissipates in the air when they build a fire, or they can divine by the flight of birds, or by the ripples in the water, or by ashes, by throwing water in ashes in hot spots, or 
letting a candle drip on a paper and the way the drippings so they'll actually those drippings if you're if you're seeking information they'll actually drip and form certain figures that can be interpreted by a uh, uh, psychic you can learn to do it yourself I wouldn't advise it but uh, <clears throat> are casting sticks down see a lot of these ways are still used today uh, some of them have been refined uh, where they use sticks and instead of a Ouija board you can buy those in most dime stores uh, they have names of these games and you cast the sticks down the way they fall they tell you various things but the ones that we're most familiar with is what I want to uh, to stress this evening such as astrology uh, most people do not know or many people do not connect astrology with fortune telling they just think you know it's something uh, a lot of people something innocent they can read it in the newspaper of course any newspaper you take today is going to have its horoscope column <coughs> Because millions of devotees follow this. Uh, many of them say they don't believe it, but they can't uh, keep away from reading it every day to see how things are going to turn out for them. But astrology is a form of divination based upon the ancient Babylonian system of dividing the heavens into 12 sections with respect to the 12 major constellations and I guess everybody knows what a constellation is that's a group of stars and there's nothing wrong with astronomy we're talking about astrology and uh, astronomy is kind of a hobby with me but not astrology <laughs> astronomy is valid a valid science and astrology you see is based upon a valid science with respect to its use of the constellations and the ancient Babylonians and Egyptians they divided the heavens up into 12 sections with a constellation in each one you see <clears throat> at certain times of the year the sun always rises in different parts of the heavens I guess you know that too don't you from your study of astronomy somewhere and uh, the the theory of this thing is and it has multitudes hooked on it you see because they follow this as faithfully as any religion the theory is that if the sun rises at various periods of the year then it will be in one of those uh, signs of the zodiac like Leo or Cancer or Aquarius you know we're supposed to be coming into the age of Aquarius the water carrier and all these are names of the 12 major constellations and if you're born you see when you're like you're born in June or January you were born under a sign because the sun was in that far, part of the zodiac at a certain time of the year. Now that's a very simple explanation of it, but all the planets you see are revolving around the sun too. And when you were born, if Venus or Mars or Jupiter was also in that, then that means certain things, good or bad. And uh, now the, all that tells you is uh, uh, what sign you were born under, which will determine your character and your outlook and whether you're going to turn out good or bad. And all of that uh, you get psychic readings that way but but then the, the, when the horoscope is cast and if you follow this stuff in the newspaper I mean that's close enough to get hurt there uh, without having a horoscope cast for you which you can get I can get them for you for three dollars in the, out of the pulp magazines they really advertise they'll cast your horoscope for three dollars good one it's about fifty dollars and <laughs> And then they will tell you where, where your sign, what you were born under, and what that means, and and when certain signs, uh, like planets, are in your, uh, uh, come into your area of uh, your birth, the sign which you were born under, then you can or can't do certain things. You know, depending on where it is in that area of the uh, constellation at a particular time of the year and uh, it, your life the life of multitudes of people especially show people they're going for this uh, and leaders government leaders political leaders <coughs> uh, seem to be attracted to this because you see their future is always so uncertain a uh, person say in show business or in, in business his future is, is not like a person who draws a check every week and uh, he knows he's not going very far but he knows where he can go each week and so people, because especially in a time like we live now, are so afraid, times are so uncertain, so much fear, war, and so many threats, that uh, they're seeking to the astrologers and the psychics, government leaders, everyone else. 
I mean government leaders from the top to the least, uh, all over the world. This common knowledge, <coughs> like Roosevelt, uh, for example, saw uh, readings from Jean Dixon and got them several times. By the way, she predicted his death. Uh, they always predict the morbid, and he died within the reasonable time. She said, you have about six months, and he died in about six months. But uh, people who follow this, you see, then, then day to day, as you read a horoscope in a newspaper, you see, you relate your birth date and that sort of thing to whatever the reading is. I know that's pretty general. But the point is, people think they don't get hurt, and they do, because spirits, demonic spirits, work through the thought realm. And where you say, well, I don't believe it, you really haven't said anything. Why are you reading it, keeping up with it? You don't believe it, and uh, you think it's a bunch of hocus-pocus and doesn't amount to anything, and you laugh at it. Some people do. And... Uh, Say, well, how can it influence me just reading it? But see, there's an unconscious influence exerted on you. And you don't, generally, you don't stop to think about the unconscious influence that is exerted. You don't read a thing that doesn't influence you one way or another. There's no way to keep it from influencing you positively or negatively. There's no way in the world you can leave here, whether you're new or one of the members of this body, and not be influenced by what was said tonight. Negatively or positively. It depends on how you react to it and also depends on whether or not it's God's Word or not. Whether it's good or bad. But you can't help but be influenced. It may ground you when you read something that isn't right. It may ground you in what's wrong with it so you can go against that thing. You see, if you're reading it for that purpose, then it could mean something else. I've got tons of occult literature, but I wouldn't let you read any of them. You know, unless you were going to need something to help somebody show them what's wrong with Rosicrucianism. Our theosophy. Are we coming through out there? <laughs> that that you, you can't help but be influenced unless you are guarded by the knowledge that you're doing this because God has told you to do it and you're under the blood. For example, here's one case of a man who uh, was on a business trip, went into a motel room, and they had some motels furnish you with newspapers. There was a newspaper, and he had nothing else to read. And just out of curiosity, well, he was read, leafing through the newspaper, and out of curiosity, there was a horoscope column. And so, out of curiosity, he didn't believe in it, but he said, I read the thing under my birth date, and it said that, I, that tomorrow I needed to be especially careful to avoid any serious accident and so on and so forth, because I was under that kind of a sign, you know, and it was a dangerous time for me. It'd be better if I could stay in. Uh, now, you can poo-poo that and laugh it off. And most people don't. And so, <clears throat> but he said, well, that didn't bother me, but he said the next day, he said it was out on my business trip and out, out driving along, when he said I, I suddenly was aware that I was very tense and anxious and worried and afraid. And couldn't figure out why I was so upset this way until it dawned on me that I was subconsciously being influenced by that thing I'd read. He said it did affect me. And he quit reading. That was his first and last time. Uh, now, it doesn't always have to be that dramatic, friends. God, you know, was good to him. It doesn't always have to be that dramatic because it can be like the man, and I've dealt with so many people that... Uh, uh, we could give you all kinds of examples, but like the man <clears throat> that because of his dabbling with astrology, he got seriously interested in it, then got hooked on it uh, in the sense that he was psychically and physically oppressed. And he was one of the worst doubters I have ever seen in my life. He wanted to believe, and he couldn't. Couldn't believe. For all the things he wanted to believe, he said, I know they're there, and he said, I believe God has a ministry for me and everything. But I'm just bound with this doubt. So he hadn't been able to work in four years, and he couldn't. The devil had him bound mentally and physically. Well, praise God, we took him through the occult, and it was not a simple process with him because he wasn't just bound physically, he was bound in his mind, you see. And after some time of encouragement and, uh, and praying with him, uh, the last we heard of him, he was back to work. But, <clears throat> and... Uh, but I'll tell you, it's, there's no such thing as innocent participation. Now, astrology doesn't sound like much, to be sure. 
But it's as ancient as Babylon, condemned by God. Way back here in Daniel 2, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep broke from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to come and tell him the dream. Now that's about as ancient as you can get. Back in Babylon, you see it also in... Um, uh, uh, here in Deuteronomy 18, which is even before this. This is about the time of Daniel, about, say, the 7th century before Christ. Moses is way back in the uh, 1,500 years before Christ, 3,500 years ago. And Moses is warning us against, you know, those things back in Deuteronomy 18. So it's not only here in Babylon, but they had it back in Egypt because he's warning the, the uh, Israelites who came out of Egypt against that. Isaiah 47, you see it again, the condemnation by God of astrology. Here he's just calling for them, but in Isaiah 47, God condemns it. Well, we don't have time to look up all those passages. So I say uh, we give you a lot of texts in our book uh, for some of these things. And then <clears throat> we're talking about the abomination of divination. Another form is the one that's probably most common, card laying. Now, if you go to a fortune teller, they generally don't look through a crystal ball. We'll save that for a moment. That's Gene Dixon's expression. But generally, they will use cards. And again, <coughs> people are thinking in terms of innocent uh, piece of cardboard and playing other games with cards, not realizing that cards were invented for the purpose of predicting the future. And uh, the tarot deck, which is still can still be purchased, uh, contains 78 cards. And when they were reduced to four suits so you could play poker, bridge, or whatever, your, whatever people play with them, um, they were reduced to 52. And so now the fortune tellers a lot of times have adapted themselves to using that deck. So you can tell a fortune with 52 cards or 78. It really doesn't matter. You can tell a fortune with a sheep sliver. Uh, divine by sheep sliver. Yeah, over... <laughs> Or in Ezekiel, it talks about Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, no, this is in Isaiah. It tells about Nebuchadnezzar divining by the sheep's liver. He looked into the liver, and uh, he divined in other ways, and he shook the arrows. That was using kind of using the idea of the pendulum. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, used all the methods, you see, of sorcery. And uh, in that particular passage, he's determining whether he wants to go up against the uh, Arabs first, uh, the um, non-Jewish uh, element, are the uh, go up against the Jews, and he's divining which one is going, which land is going to conquer first. But card laying is just is just a a means of divining the future. The cards have certain meanings. If you don't know anything about it, you don't need to know anything about it. But the cards have certain meanings, like seven of hearts, love, and and ten of spades, you know, uh, good luck, and other cards determining death. And the way these things are laid out, you see, they can accurately many times depict uh, the future and can uh, psychically relate to you in such a way that they can tell you things about yourself. Now, I know there's a lot of fake in some psychic circles and among fortune tellers and this sort of thing, but a lot of it isn't fake. And what's fake is simply they're trying to fill in the gap because the spirits are moving too slow for them, uh, revealing information. So what's fake is still uh, satanically inspired, but uh, I have yet to talk to anyone, and I've dealt with many hundreds of people, and uh, a large majority of those have been to fortune tellers. That seems to be the common occult involvement. I have yet. I do not recall an instance where what they told them didn't come to pass. Now, that's batting a thousand friends. If it's the death of a baby, you'll marry in two years, uh, you'll go bankrupt, you'll fall off your bicycle, I see you in 12 months falling off your bicycle, breaking your leg, whatever it is, comes to pass. I haven't had anybody tell me it didn't. Now, I know sometimes it doesn't because they've guessed, but I'm talking about they're dealing uh, in a realm of revelation where they have their source uh, of revelation 
coming direct from the powers of darkness. One woman that we dealt with, for example, just started reading cards out of fun, telling fortunes for her friends. She came to us for help. And uh, a Christian woman, by the way, spirit-filled, could speak in tongues. So uh, we're talking not about uh, fortune tellers. We're talking about someone who should have known better but got the dabbling in it and said, the first thing I knew, I was telling them things that would come to pass. Said, what cured me, I was reading for a neighbor when suddenly I saw a vision of her. Now, she didn't have visions, you know, otherwise. Uh, she said, I had a vision of her and saw her uh, divorced and married to another person. She said, that, that frightened me to death. I didn't tell her, you know, what it was. It said it actually came to pass. And I, it frightened me, so I gave up card reading. Her point was that there's more to laying cards, even if you start out as a game. You see, she set up a channel whereby spirits could begin to uh, manifest themselves through her to bind her, use her as an instrument, and, and get to others that way. They need channels. They have no way to harm a person who has faith, who is under the blood of Jesus. One, uh, <clears throat> uh, this wasn't in my experience, but one, uh, one tape I've got, and I've ministered with this brother, uh, quite a, uh, an interesting tape on deliverance. They just happened to have a recorder. When they were delivering, this woman had 19 demons, and the demons revealed a lot of information. One, one of the things they said that we can't touch a person with faith. Now, they're not talking about a person that says, I believe John 3.16. They got a lot of those bound up and oppressed, but a person with faith. Praise God. I was glad I had it, because I have to minister to a lot of people that need deliverance. And, uh, and sometimes people say, well, when you cast spirits out, uh, what about all these, uh, where they go to and all that? I said, well, you know, I never, never stopped thinking about that. I said, I've cast more demons out in my study over there, and I have... Uh, anywhere in my, uh, that I've ever been. I said, I don't sit around uh, thinking about demons in my study. I said, they're not there. They know they can't say. <laughs> they can't stay around faith and praising the Lord and the Word of God. <clears throat> and they won't. They'd be utterly miserable. <clears throat> but, but here's a woman, Christian, spirit-filled. Dabbling with the wrong thing. You see, she was getting out from under the protection of the blood, out of the realm of faith, moving into a realm of what she thought was innocent fun, and became psychically subjected. She was also oppressed. Uh, but that's another story. Palm reading, uh, a very common thing. So many of the people that we have dealt with have never had any context. And they'll say, oh, well, I had my palm read once at a county fair, or I went to this gypsy, or this woman across the street, but I didn't believe in it. And then got all these problems, you know, that they need help from. Uh, palm reading uh, is a very dangerous thing because it's just, it's really based upon astrology. Now, that is not an accurate expression, but people who uh, follow this and practice palm reading have to know astrology because there's much similarity between the two in the planets and names of the parts of the hand and all are named, uh, fingers and all are named after some of the constellations, that sort of thing. And so here again, uh, uh, people who have allowed themselves to have their palm read have simply just changed the mode of how they're going to contact the powers of darkness from a Ouija board or a fortune teller to, as I say, uh, there's phrenology which they can read the bumps on your head and divine. So it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it helps if you're bald <laughs> to see more bumps. But uh, No, actually they divide the skull up into various sections. And so the, the manner is not important. Like the young woman, uh, to show you how, how drastically you can be hurt, hurt even when you say you don't believe in it. I wish I could impress every one of you and everyone that I ever talked to about it but there's no such thing as innocent participation. The, the least contact often is the worst oppression. Some who are the most psychically oppressed, like one girl, had never dabbled personally. She had been taken uh, to a, a, wart, uh, a charmer who charmed warts off of her mother when she was just like five, four or five years old. 
That's the only contact she ever made. She was seeing demons. Frightening things. Wanted deliverance. Uh, could project herself out of her body. Astral projection. And told me. And weird things that uh, no point going into. Uh, scaring her to death. And um, that's the only contact. And, and to show you there was a direct relationship between that innocent involvement and uh, her deliverance. As soon as we prayed for her, she was set free. She felt it go. A year later, uh, I said, have you ever had any more frightening apparitions or any of these experiences? She said, absolutely none. She said, from that moment, I have been free. Now there, you see, so this girl I was, I was getting ready to tell you about who had her palm red, she didn't even believe it. This is an authenticated case on record. is isn't out of my experience, but because uh, it uh, proves the point so well, I'll share it from another brother. Uh, and tells of this case that he knows of first time where this uh, gypsy came to this girl's home to sell some things. They were traveling through the countryside <clears throat> and she wasn't interested in buying anything and the gypsy kind of got mad and grabbed her hand and said, well, I see you'll marry in two years anyway. And since the girl was signal, single and uh, that probably touched uh, a tender spot, <laughs> Uh, she allowed herself to have her fortune told, you see. Because that, you see, that was very subtle. And the gypsy went on and told her fortune. She said, yes, you'll marry in two years, and you'll bear a child at such and such a time, and you'll die shortly after the birth of the child. Well, she didn't believe it. Told others about it, and it's on record, and immediately after the birth of the child, she went into kind of delirium, rising temperature uh, out of her head and then out of her mind literally lost her mind was put in a mental institution and died three days after being in the institution now if you can call that coincidence I don't suggest that anybody here would some people would they say well that's coincidence but when you just keep multiplying multiplying these, are, these experiences uh, not only in my own ministry but the ministries of others uh, it gets beyond the realm of, of coincidence, like, as I say, when I have prayed and prayed for so many people who couldn't get the baptism or were being oppressed mentally or physically, financially, domestically, pray for them because of some occult involvement, and then see, generally, many times, immediately a change. Either the healing comes, or, like this girl, all this psychic oppression left her, uh, the evidence is overwhelming that there's a direct connection between making contact with occult spirits and what they're suffering. Then God condemns uh, divining, uh, as I say, which takes many forms. There is the divining rod or the uh, uh, water witching, which is a very common thing. We run in this constantly. Ministers, some of them are very good at it. And they think it's a gift from God sometimes. That is water witching, divining with a willow twig or a coat hanger or a welding rod. You can divine, as I said, with anything. If you can't find a willow twig or a hazel twig, uh, then you can use uh, a couple of pork chop bones. That's, that's really, it does, just really doesn't matter. The idea of a willow twig, it's a forked stick. The reason they use that is because of its pliability. Uh, when they get over the water or the oil or the gold or whatever they're looking for, uh, that thing will bend, you see, without breaking. Bend, you see, without breaking. And so I see no other connection between using the willow and the hazel twig than that because it works with anything else. I've got uh, articles in my files and people I talk to, they use anything, anything available. Uh, it's a very common thing and it's being popularized today in many <coughs> ways that you might be surprised. Uh, engineers who cannot, they've lost the plans in some of these old towns where the water mains or sewer lines are laid and digging, you can't dig up the whole town. And uh, uh, this is just common knowledge on record, a fact that time and again they'll hire them a water diviner, a water witcher. And he'll get his hazel twig, will a twig, and just go through the town and locate all the sewer lines and water pipes. There. One young man that uh, we couldn't find any other occult involvement, he was suffering from a, a moral problem, wanted to be shut of it, rid of it, and couldn't get rid of it. And uh, 
found out that, that he worked for his father as a plumber, and that's the way they located the water lines and the sewer lines. It was easier than digging up everybody's yard all over the place. You know, if they didn't know where it was, he just divined for it. And of course, that twig or whatever you're using, if you have that power, and of course not everyone does, or you'd have everybody doing it, except people who know better. If you have that power, then that thing will, will bend and direct down toward the water. Now, we get a lot of uh, uh, criticism from people who say that it is simply the manifestation of the magnetic forces uh, between outer space or the atmosphere and whatever is uh, in the core of the earth. And when you get whatever you're using to divine water with, to find water, uh, in that line, magnetic pull, then it just automatically happens. They try to explain it away as a non-psychic, non-occult thing. The only problem with that is, is that, uh, first of all, the Bible condemns it. Uh, and if you want to know where that is, that's over in Hosea 4.12. Uh, might take a quick look at that. Uh, Hosea 4.12. Not only does the Bible condemn it, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary, that it's not merely a magnetic pull upon the willow tree. Now, he's condemning them for their idolatry. My people ask counsel at their stocks, that is, idols. You know, the Hebrew is something made out of wood, a wooden idol. They ask counsel from the wooden idols, and their staff declares unto them. Now that word staff in the Hebrew means a diviner's rod. In other words, their staff as they divine whatever they're looking for, whatever they're using it for, divines for them. Uh, Hosea 4.12. Now, from practical experience, <coughs> we have found that this does work. And when I say practical experience, I mean dealing and counseling with people. And to prove that it's not just uh, an arbitrary, physical, natural law at work is that many, many things are found and located by using a map of the site. Maybe the water you're divining for is 1,500 miles away. A person who is really good at this, I mean, really has a strong psychic uh, uh, leaning in this direction, water diviner. He can divine right over a map and find oil, gold. You'd be surprised how much gold, diamonds, have been located uh, in this method. Over maps of, say, of, of an area in South America <coughs> where they suspect there's gold. Uh, now, it isn't 100% accurate all the time. If it were, why, well, we've already found all the gold. Uh, somebody would seen to that. But the point is that it does work, and it works consistently when a person like Hercos or uh, Croiset or some of these present-day psychics who are really, uh, really possessed with a, with a spirit of divination use these things. They can locate missing bodies. They don't have to run out and search the lake or the countryside uh, when they take on a case, and they're used by the police constantly, constantly, all over this world. And both of them are here in America now and been used by police for years uh, to find, locate murderers or missing bodies. And... Uh, Rather than go out with a divining rod and search, they simply you give them a map of the site where you suspect the body is or the murder occurred, and they can find it. And this, they, they have consistent results. And they divine over the telephone. Uh, so if it's a magnetic pull on the willow twig, they're not even where it is that they're trying to find. You know, and they're divining over the phone. And the people who are psychic this way generally don't even profess to be a Christian, but if you talk to them very long, you'd see that Christianity isn't biblical Christianity, even they said they were. Uh, and uh, it, it, there's a psychic drain on these people, and the fact that it's a gift time and again, it can be passed off to another. You can walk along with a person who's divining for water, or whatever he's looking for, generally it's water, and to hold their hand, and you couldn't find it in a thousand years. You can hold their hand and almost invariably then you can divine because that psychic power passes off them. Now if it's, mag if it's just animal magnetism, then how do you explain those things? 
Well, I'm telling you all this because if you deal with anyone at all in the occult area, this is going to be one of the common things you're running into. And I've met many Christians who found water uh, this way and suffering all sorts of psychic oppression. One brother, president of a full gospel businessmen's chapter, uh, confessed, I was up there speaking in that town, staying in his home, <clears throat> confessed that he got a little upset when his wife said, hey, have you read this? I've got a book called Angels of Life. And when we witch for that well, that's why the well's sulfuric. Uh, he found the well with his divining rod, but it was sulfur water. Oh, he said, I got a little upset. Said, now that, that's, uh, that's just magnetic force, or that's God, you know, they say. And so, and when he got over being upset well, and read the book, then he said, we confess that, and said, we ask God's forgiveness, and the water immediately changed to sweet water. Oh, the devil gave him water, but he always charges a price. Yeah. I was in another home. This man was an engineer. And uh, the first thing you say, oh, no, no, he's not right. And uh, another case where a wife read to him out of our book that water divining was not God, it was the devil. Anybody ought to know that. I didn't have to have anybody tell me, friends. And I'm not that smart. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I went, that's a fact. I went through the seminary and uh, saw, saw people uh, standing in the pulpit with magic charming and all that sleight of hand, that business, to try to preach the gospel. I didn't have to find a proof text that wasn't God. God isn't using the methods of darkness to present the gospel of light. Sleight of hand, deception, to try to prove the gospel. Jesus said, I am light. He says, you are light. Well, some of you look like you made a discovery when I said that. But maybe you need to. I don't care what preacher is using magic tricks in the pulpit. God condemns that in his word. You don't use the methods of, well, why don't you do card tricks? You know, why don't I preach the gospel? Uh, well, anyhow, I think it's all too obvious. And I didn't have to tell anybody to tell me water witching was wrong, but uh, so many right away, they want to say, oh, there's nothing wrong with that because they've got their well, you know. It did work. And he confessed about the same thing that happened to him. He said, the water came in all right because you couldn't drink it. He said, it was red, you know, just the reddest blood. And uh, said, we... Now, I didn't tell him about the other, but he said the same thing. So we got on our knees and confessed this, and immediately the water turned pure and white. I, I drank both cases, both out of both wells. It's good water. <laughs> good. Because that's all the water they had. But the water cleared up right away. You say coincidence, and that isn't the only story. I've had others tell me the same thing. So they couldn't drink it <clears throat> until they confessed it was alcohol. And then it cleared up. And so there is a direct connection between these. Uh, <clears throat> now he calls it here in Hosea a staff, which in the Hebrew means uh, the wand or the rod of the sorcerer, diviner. And uh, there's a direct connection between that, uh, between a divining rod and this other thing that, uh, that could be included here, the pendulum. Since he speaks of a staff, a pendulum it often is just a, a stick or a staff or an object that is held in the hand and it'll begin to move when it's over whatever you want. Uh, women, we deal with mothers who are psychically oppressed. And women have used like a needle or a ring or a key on a string and held it over the abdominal region when they're expecting a child to determine the sex of the baby. Uh, and it moves back and forth if it's a male and swings in circles if it's a girl. I think it's the other way around because uh, uh, this, it doesn't matter. You don't need to try it. But it actually works. And again, of course, some people try to explain it away as a subconscious influence, but you can actually uh, put, rest that hand down to where it can't move and just hold that steady and let somebody else hold your hand. It'll start invariably. You can hold it over a map. If you want to be, if you want the spirits to direct you, they uh, won't move until if you're looking for a certain place, you're lost, and that thing will start moving when you get in the right place. Now this has been tested time and time again. Start swinging. Uh, that's one of the easiest ways to divine is with the pendulum. Uh, some people put a, a, a key or their ring over the Bible and then start leaping through, and it won't move until uh, the verse that they're supposed that's supposed to enlighten them or help them. Then it'll start swinging in a circle. And, of course, the devil used the Bible. He quoted scripture to Satan. 
quoted Psalm 91. He knows the Bible. And so the pendulum. Here again, what you're doing, you're opening yourself, you see, to the subjection to the powers of darkness. There has to be a channel open somewhere. And before they can begin to move into and work through a life. Uh, I talked to a doctor who works... Well, he said he was going to give it up. This has been a couple of years ago since I've seen him. I assume by now he's out of that clinic. But he worked in a clinic uh, where the head of the clinic uses a pendulum. This, in this particular case, is just a piece of precious metal. It, it could be anything. So it could be a key, a needle, or anything on a piece of string. And when he has a patient, before he prescribes to them, he has all of his medicines that he could possibly prescribe. Uh, in little bottles, and he puts the pendulum over them until the pendulum begins to move in a certain way, and that's when he's prescribed. You see, and not only uh, does he get hurt by it, but the people that seek his help invariably get psychically oppressed. The doctor was telling me this. He didn't know it was wrong until he read our book, Angels of Light, and he said that uh, he said he discovered now, since he's been working in that clinic, that he has become psychic just being there. He said, I'm able to diagnose illness that uh, I can just point right to the place on their body where they're sick and tell them what it is. Uh, he said, I'm getting out of here. Uh, he realizes, of course, the dangers. And he is terribly oppressed, by the way. Never saw the connection until it was shown to him. But the use of the pendulum, I'm going to tell you something that some of you didn't know, is more common than you might think in doctors, chiropractors, uh, healers, possession. Now, I'm not implying that every doctor, a lot of them wouldn't know what a pendulum was, but there are a lot of them who diagnose this way. And uh, after listening to you or examining you, uh, they excuse themselves. Of course, every doctor is always off in another room, and you don't know who's involved and who isn't, and they don't advertise this stuff. And they diagnose your illness. Uh, they can use it over a chart or, a, or over a skeleton, anything to diagnose the problem. Uh, it's more common than you might you might be willing to think possible the use of the term pendulum. Well, in many other ways, I said the crystal ball, all of this is still divining, that one term. You spend a week on each of these terms. Divining the crystal ball, Gene Dixon has popularized this. Uh, it's quite commonly used in fortune-telling, psychic. And what happens is... Uh, uh, they, they're able through psychic, uh, a psychic trance or submitting themselves to the spirits working through them, see pictures and images, sometimes names and addresses. In the ball, they actually see this, what you would call a vision. And uh, this is why divining by water or with a mirror is just as effective, because anything that will reflect the vision. Uh, I know of one case where uh, a young boy was obsessed with fear, teenage boy, had had it all of his life, where they called in a gypsy, and uh, she took a raw egg, still in the shell, and just waved it, moved around over his body, uttering her magic conjurations, and then called for a glass, broke the egg in the glass, and then saw the picture of what was wrong with him in the yolk of the egg. Now, that's not uncommon. That's almost a common way for some uh, psychic to divine. In this particular case, they saw a demonic face uh, that had frightened him as a boy about three or four, and it was the exact duplicate of a gorilla mask his father had worn on a Halloween night had come up to the door, and when the boy opened it, scared him to death. And ever since then, see, a spirit like that had been oppressing him, a spirit of fear. Of course, the old gypsy uh, this is the way she discerned it. Well, the boy got rid of the spirit of fear, and of course you know the rest of the story. He got oppressed in some other way. So Satan doesn't uh, cast out Satan. But Jean Dixon uses this method, and she has been able to accurately to predict the death of Roosevelt, petitioning of India, uh, the rise and fall of Khrushchev, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Now these are and many other things. These are not just coincidences. These are big things. The death and success of the Nehru and so on. Uh, what's the source of her powers? She tells in her book 
that a gypsy gave her a crystal ball and a deck of tarot cards. And I think she had an encounter with a circus, didn't she? She read her book. Well, she's got many, many followers, high leaders in government, political circles, religious circles, uh, because she is a devout Roman Catholic, says, confesses, and, and believes in her gifts of God. That's why it's so deceptive. She uses religious terms a lot of time, and uh, fools the gullible and the weak. But I don't know of a case in the Bible where a false prophet ever said he was following the devil. I mean, I just, uh, in fact, they were actually deluded. They actually believed they were getting their revelations from God. They had, uh, for some reason or another, now false prophets in the Bible are not always priests of Baal. And that sort of thing where obviously they're false. But time and time again in Scripture, they're said to be a prophet. They're called a prophet. But they give false revelations. Like over in Jeremiah 28. Just to give you an example that a prophet never considered himself false. And that he often was getting revelations by dreamer vision or anointing, but he was getting them from the wrong source because they were out of harmony with God's will and revelation, previous revelation. Here in Jeremiah 28, Hananiah, it came to pass in the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, Hannah and I, the prophet. See, he called a false prophet. Which was of Gibeon, spake unto me, Jeremiah's talking, he spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the temple, in the presence of the priests and of the people, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, You see, thus saith the Lord. He has the divine formula all the other prophets use. He goes on to prophesy that in two years, Israel will be restored from Babylon. Some had already been carried captive. There was two captivities, and the big one hasn't taken place yet. Jeremiah is going to take place very, very soon. Hen and I prophesied they'll be back in two years. Jeremiah already has prophesied in chapter 27, 25, that they'll be there 70 years. So who are you going to believe? We've got two that call themselves prophets. They both say, Thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah said, Thus saith the Lord, they'll be over there 70 years in Babylon, in captivity. And I said, Two years. Well, of course, the test of history proved Hananiah wrong and Jeremiah right. Uh, but over in verse 15, Then the prophet Jeremiah <coughs> said unto Hananiah the prophet, Notice he's still called a prophet. Here now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. So it was a prophet, but he was a false prophet. But he was prophesying in the name of the Lord. You've got to have some tests besides uh, somebody saying, I had a vision, or thus saith the Lord, or uh, seeing a miracle. Because the devil can do all of those things. He certainly can. And so Jean Dixon, when she says that she is a devout Roman Catholic and she believes her gifts from God, she is sincere. And over in 1 Kings 22, when Micaiah said to King Ahab, he said, if you go up against Ramoth Gilead, you won't come back alive. And, he, and, and King Ahab had 400 prophets in his pay, and they were called prophets. They weren't called false prophets. They were just eating at his table. <laughs> and therefore, they weren't in tune with God. We can assume that. And, and the Zedekiah, one of the prophets, went up when, when Micaiah prophesied that against Ahab, he went up and slapped his face. And he said, when did the Spirit of, when did the Spirit of God leave me and go over to you? Now he was saying, I have the Spirit of God. And he just prophesied. He told, he told Ahab, go up and you'll be successful and you'll come back in victory. Micaiah said, he comes back at all. God hasn't spoken to me. He won't even come back, period. Except dead. And again, the test of history proved Micaiah right because they had came back dead. But uh, uh, the Zedekiah, the other prophet, the professing prophet, 
who said he had a revelation, said, now when did the Spirit leave me that I just prophesied he'd come back in safety, leave me and go to you and prophesy something contrary. So Gene Dixon isn't going to run around and saying, I've got my plug in down below and I'm getting my revelation. And God isn't going to knock you over or shout down from heaven and saying she's a, a witch and a, and, a, and a medium and a spiritualist and a fortune teller. He's going to expect you to know some things, and that's why we teach from He expects you to know that, that getting your revelations from tarot cards and crystal balls, he just expects you to know that's not God. You may not be able to, to technically tell a person where it's wrong and what's wrong with it, but you ought to know. If you have the Holy Spirit, you can't help but know that's wrong. And uh, then the Ouija board. Everybody knows about that. So there's no book has popularized it. You can get it on sale at Ward. <laughs> and we read you last time that pathetic letter. Remember that woman that's crying out for help? Said the demons, and she said, it all began with that Ouija board that I thought was a toy. Demons trying to eat my brain. And she's not crazy. She's in these bunches. They stirred. And they torment her in body and mind. Ouija board and this uh, professor up in the college in New England uh, who wrote me and said that uh, after hearing me speak up in Toronto that, that uh, a student there was hearing voices and seeing demonic apparitions and tried to tell people about it and they, you know, they want to put you away. And uh, she said she came to me and I gave her your book, Angels of Light, and said she, in one morning she read that and came back that afternoon and said, well, this is it. She says, what is said here is what's happening to me, and said, it all began when I, when I read, when I played with Ouija board. Said, I began to see these awful creatures. You know, not visions, but there they are. They're right in the room with me. And uh, they, they talk to me and make all sorts of suggestions and threats and they tried to deliver her. Uh, she was just a novice. She, the woman, she had just heard, you know, the one message on deliverance and was not really able to help her because the girl wanted deliverance, but she said, the demons right now are laughing at me and saying I can't be delivered. Well, she didn't. She said, what do I do next? She wrote me wanting to know what to do next. Well, <laughs> what you do next, of course, is obvious to persons who have little teaching and training. They tell them to laugh right back at them. <laughs> Amen. So you just tell them that, that, that you're going to be and you are free of them. You start talking back to them. You see, because they'll bind you as long as you let them. But um, in some cases they're a little difficult because, you see, the person uh, listens to the voice of the demon rather than to you or to the Word of God <clears throat> because it's a very real thing when you're hearing voices in your head. Well, I don't know about all of these other, these other treatments, uh, these other uh, abominations. Uh, we've covered some of them. You've got uh, magic practices here, the enchanter, the charmer. Spiritualism is a whole subject in itself. I'm not going to try to deal with all of these. But magic practices, hypnosis, magic charming, healing by magic. You can be healed by magic. Can the devil heal? The Bible says he can. But you see, you pay the price. Hypnosis, two kinds, medical hypnosis, magic hypnosis. Uh, and we today have made those two distinctions in the Bible <clears throat> down through history. There was never any distinction made. It was always witchcraft. But today I get letters from people who heard me speak or read my book and uh, I could bring some of those and read to you like I did a couple of weeks ago. Some of that fan mail. That <laughs> <coughs> where they just say, oh man, you're just not with it because we, I'm a nurse, you know, and we use this and we help this patient help that. And where you show that there's oppression, actually those people are already oppressed. They already had emotional problems and this simply caused it to come forth. That's my point. Then. That caused, when they were hypnotized, you see. A lot of people do have problems, and hypnosis opens the door. You break down the barriers, and the spirits can begin to manifest. 
Uh, but of course, that isn't always the explanation. But they don't. She didn't realize what she was saying when she said a person has problems and hypnosis didn't cause them; they just caused them to come forth. Trying to defend hypnotherapy, uh, a lot of doctors use it. I have a good friend, charismatic, that needs enlightenment here. He just refuses to admit hypnosis and ventriloquism are the devil. Uh, but uh, I don't know whether it's medical pride or what, but uh, I'm just going to state the case that that you're going to be bound some way yourself as long as you think there's nothing wrong with some of these things. That, that in itself is uh, evidence of some form of delusion. I know of one particular case where I had been speaking on this subject and uh, the woman wrote a few months after had been in that town and said that her daughter, she had submitted, the woman who wrote had submitted hypnosis for the birth of a child and said that her daughter was born in the world with serious, deep emotional disturbances and said that I immediately after the birth of the child began to suffer serious depression. Now, this is not the thing, you know, like a rainy day and you don't feel so well and you're okay the next day, but serious, morbid, melancholy depression. And until I spoke on it, she didn't know what it was. And they went through the deliverance. And this had gone on, the girl was up, you know, teenager now, and all of her life, serious, deep emotional problems. And then wrote that after going through that, they had been set free from the depression and emotional disturbances. And she's given the time enough, you know, to know that there was a direct connection. <coughs> Hypnosis. Well, I got a letter, you know, as a result of that one. Yeah, from a nurse, you know. A long letter and an article by some famous medical scientist that hypnosis was now a valid means of uh, helping, helping people uh, in ways that uh, drugs and medical science can't help them otherwise. You know, after you've had a person on drugs for a long time and uh, have insomnia or some other uh, nervous disorder, they're neurotic, then they argue you can use hypnosis and... Uh, and uh, make the proper suggestions while they're under the control of your will and relieve them of that where drugs and any other type of therapy won't work. And what invariably happens, this person, while they may get rid of that thing, they take on something else. And time and time again this happens. Uh, if no other way, they're damaged and hurt spiritually. And this is an area, of course, in which uh, you can't analyze or weigh it accurately. You just know it happens because you have to deal with these people where their faith is damaged, where they're chronic doubters and uh, skeptics and full of anxiety and that sort of thing. And a, a medical doctor isn't going to accept that as a result of his hypnosis, you see. Uh, but we see that if there's no other kind of damage, there's always the worst kind, that's spiritual. If it isn't financial or marital or, de or uh, physical uh, or mental, it is spiritual, psychic, and that's the worst kind, worst way you can get hurt. And uh, too many cases of where doctors use this and the person has been helped or uh, relieved of that problem and then the family notices that they, they uh, develop uh, an incurable appetite for alcohol or they become... Uh, they fly into a rage over nothing, develop, have a spirit of anger. And uh, unless they're shown the connection, of course, they wouldn't uh, see that it's off cough oppression, but the point is they see a change came over them after that treatment. You could just delve into this whole area at length and uh, uh, show that, uh, show, demonstrate what I'm showing, trying to show that uh, there are connections. But you can do your own research uh, to prove that people do get hurt. And the demons themselves. Anybody here believe in demons? Demons. Some of these times when you're dealing with demons and uh, the Spirit so moves upon you to question them about some things, you ask them uh, if the person you're dealing with had been involved in any form of hypnotism or ha had ever uh, submitted himself to hypnosis. That would be the one to ask because he'll have that kind of spirit many times. If you're dealing with a person where the spirits are talking through them, I'm saying, you see, then ask the spirit, the source, who's behind? What's the power behind hypnotism? You'll, you'll invariably get one answer. 
You don't need three devils. They always serve the devil. Invariably serve the devil. Magic charming, it does work. Healing by magic. I've dealt with ministers. Been healed this way. Ministers wise. It isn't just, you know, people who shouldn't know better. Should know better. And uh, invariably, they're suffering. That's why they're coming to you. They're suffering something else. Like one minister was healed of an incurable infection. His marriage was... Uh, to say the least, disharmonious, they couldn't get along at all. And trace back to that. <clears throat> because divisive spirits move in as a result of that. Well, that's called white magic, and there's black magic, and that's practiced. Uh, you wouldn't have to go very far around North Webster or Warsaw and find people who are practicing black magic. Black magic is to put a curse or uh, evil eye on someone. It does work. If the person is uh, psychically... Uh, in tune with the spirits, the powers of darkness. In every one of these cases we're giving you, we have dealt with people that, and not just one, but in every case, there have been several instances where the people said, you know, it does work. Magic works. Magic charming. There are books on magic that do work. And there's white and black magic. White is to heal or to help. Uh, you find a suitor, a marriage partner. Or to get healed, that sort of thing. Black magic, as I say, is to put the evil eye or curse on someone. Like one girl read our book, got set free, got saved and set free from this power, but she was studying to be a witch, and she could put the evil eye on people. Now, this is one of other cases we could mention, and told me how that, uh, uh, gave me several instances of how it did work, but one of the most remarkable was that a girl had laughed at her once, for some reason or other, and she said, I decided to put the curse on her. She went back, you know, into her bedroom, went through the magic ritual and put the curse on her. And the curse was that she'd lose her teeth, her hair, and she was a pretty girl and her face would be scarred up. And she said the very next day, in an automobile accident, knocked her teeth out. And because of the nature of the scalp wound, she had to shave her head, so she lost her hair. That temporarily, but she lost it. And her face was all cut up from the windshield. Now, she said, these things are not coincidence. They happen. Now, of course, the other girl wasn't under the blood of Jesus, so it couldn't have happened to her. She wasn't walking in faith and wasn't a Christian for that matter, but the point was, it does happen. It isn't just happening over in, in uh, Africa, witch doctors with their uh, charms and all. Uh, why, you'd be surprised how many political figures and leaders have been have died mysteriously throughout this world by magic charms, black magic, where curses have been put on them. Uh, the point is that the person who is uh, really uh, knowledgeable today is the person who leaves the door open for all of these possibilities. Now, some of us, because of the length of time we spent studying and researching and dealing with people, know these things happen. Uh, but... There's some of you out there that don't know they happened, uh, but, uh, but it's a very naive person who says, oh, you know, there's no connection between some of these things. Because too many people have been damaged almost beyond repair, physically, spiritually, psychically, mentally, and every other way, just by having a wart removed by magic charming. It isn't the little thing or the thing that seems insignificant, friends. It's making the contact with that source, that occult source, the powers of darkness. And the oppression, the degree of oppression has nothing to do. There's no relationship between the nature of the contact. That's why some people can stand in a room where they're playing with a Ouija board, won't have anything to do with it, and then they come to us for deliverance. And I mean they're really needing deliverance in many ways. All the way I was in the room. Others can play with it and show no real oppression, at least not right away, but it'll come out later. You see, it'll be in that area of skepticism or doubt or the faith of them. A thing that, <clears throat> that a knowledgeable person, spiritually knowledgeable person, can discern right away. You see, I can talk to a person right away. I know uh, they, oh, it didn't bother me to say, but you talk to them a while and you see that they have no faith or they're skeptical. And so they've been hurt there. And you can't say, well, here it is. I see it right away. Because then, because they are skeptical, they wouldn't believe you. Because that's a part of the uh, way in which they're bound. Um, 
Now, in conclusion, for the benefit of those who have had some form of occult involvement and wish to close the door to any oppression as a result of such participation, I want to set forth the necessary steps to take. Of course, first of all, there must be a confession of faith in Christ if the person is not a Christian, for this is the basis for any deliverance or liberation. If the person who needs liberation is already a Christian, as many are, then he needs only to affirm his faith in Christ. And so basically then, the steps to take for liberation from occult oppression is first of all confession of occult sins. All occult involvement must be confessed if liberation is to be realized. The oppressed should name each specific form of participation which can be recalled and confess it to God as sin. The individual should, for example, make a confession similar to the following. Father, I confess that I have sinned by consulting the fortune teller, by attending a seance or a spiritualist meeting, by inquiring with the Ouija board, or by allowing myself to be hypnotized, and so forth. And I confess this as sin and put it under the blood in Jesus' name. Now accept your forgiveness in faith. And the second step is the renunciation of Satan and the command to depart. Now this is not a prayer, not a prayer to God or to Satan. It's a command to Satan from the person seeking or needing the deliverance from oppression. It's a command to Satan for him to depart in Jesus' name. Now no one else can do this for the oppressed or subjected individual inasmuch as it was by an act of this individual's will that the door was opened to the enemy in the first place. And it's only by an act of this individual's will and a command to depart will Satan leave, at least permanently. This is another reason why many times those who were occultly subjected or oppressed were not permanently liberated, although others have prayed for them to be delivered. Satan contends in the case of occult involvement that he has the right of access to this person who has invited him in through occult participation and that he will not leave until the same individual, by an act of his will, renounces him and com commands him to depart. And so at this point, the oppressed individual should say something like this, Satan, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to release me from all of your oppression as a result of my occult participation. I close the door on you and your works forever in Jesus' name. Be certain to mention occult participation, for this is where Satan has you bound. Then there is a responsibility of the liberated which follows. The important thing to remember at this point that after deliverance has taken place that the deliverance is a walk. It's not a once-for-all experience without any responsibilities on the part of the person who's been set free. After deliverance, it's necessary for the person who's been liberated to build certain safeguards around the ground that has been liberated and recovered from the enemy. Jesus warns of this, for example, in Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45. Generally, the individual should avoid all future contact with any form of spiritism or false religious cults. He should be on guard against any new or strange doctrines that are not in harmony with Scripture. Moreover, one should not neglect to destroy all occult objects in literature without regard to their cost such as fortune-telling cards, Ouija boards, occult games, magic books, or literature from such cults as Rosicrucians, Christian Science, Unity, and such authors as Edgar Cayce, Harold Sherman, Gene Dixon, and such like. Now it is imperative that one cultivate a strong faith in spiritual life after deliverance. And so we suggest that one engage himself in a serious study of the Scriptures. In the second place, develop a consistent, faithful prayer life. Thirdly, spiritual fellowship with other members of the body of Christ is essential. Fourthly, resistance. After liberation, Satan may seek to oppress again or through temptation attempt to entice the individual to yield to him in order to gain access to his life once more. And so it's well to remember that Satan must have the consent of the individual's will in order to gain such access. 
And so it is important to keep in mind the following principles in time of temptation. Confess your victory and deliverance through Jesus' blood. Revelation 12:11. Claim your authority over Satan by virtue of your position with Christ. Ephesians 2, 6. Use the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit in time of temptation or assault from the enemy. Jesus overcame Satan's temptations with the Scripture saying, It is written, Matthew 4, 1 and following. Resist Satan in faith, for we are in a spiritual warfare in which we can always have the victory if we will take it by faith. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. And command Satan to depart in Jesus' name when he tempts or attacks in any unusual manner, particularly when he seeks to take some advantage of a weakness or makes an attack through another individual. Keep guard over your mind and thoughts. Absolutely refuse entrance into your heart and mind of anything of a negative, critical, contrary, resentful, selfish, base, or depressive nature. Guard your mind jealously, for this is where the enemy usually strikes. Refuse every thought that's impure, unkind, offensive, unjust, evil, detrimental, or envious. Resist and repulse thoughts of pride and hate, resentment, slander, doubt, unbelief, anxiety, indifference, wrath, and self-pity. And in so doing, the enemy can gain no access in your life, inasmuch as the Scriptures tell us, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And we're told to keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The responsibility of the one liberated to keep the door closed to further invasions by the powers of darkness cannot be overemphasized. Victory is yours if you claim it by faith and walk in that faith. Thank you.